Uh, another edition here of Getting There with Goss, where we talk about the career journeys of athletes, coaches, media members, and more from upstate New York. I've been excited to finally share this guy's story for soccer fans. It's perfectly timed up with the World Cup as well when this is going to get released. Tyler Terrence joins us. Tyler, for those who don't know, by the way, let, let's go back to a younger version of you before we get into the whole career. Uh, six, seven, eight years old. Where'd you grow up? What'd you want to be as a kid? And was it that same dream job when you were 18 years old? Um, so I grew up in, first of all, fantastic to be here. Glad you reached out. Um, I grew up in Scotts Plains, New Jersey, which is about 20 minutes west of Newark, sort of like North Central Jersey. Um, grew up a sports addict, um, and that was passed down from my father, which was passed down from his father before him. Um, and I, I you know, I, I sort of had this sort of like stereotypical dream of uh, wanting to, you know, growing up in the burbs of Jersey for whatever reason. I was just like, I'll be a lawyer. Like, I don't know. Like, it was just really kind of lame and not to bash lawyers, but like, I don't know what 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 this six year old kid wants to be a lawyer. Well, for whatever reason, that was just sort of where, like, I, you know, when I was writing down uh, my dreams for life uh, when I was in Miss Prado's class in first grade at Coles Elementary School. But no, not at all the same job that I ended up only discovering my junior year of school at Hobart. Um, but yeah, no, kind of a wild journey to get into the booth and to get into broadcasting, but by no means was on my radar. Even going into sophomore year of college was not something I, I, I was sort of keeping tabs on. And as you got older, though, you're a pretty good athlete, able to play Division three. Take us through what opportunities were offered to you, the recruiting process, and why eventually you decided to not just select the school, but become a student athlete at that school. Yeah, so um, I, I actually wanted to play college basketball for the longest time. Basketball was sort of my, um, that was my thing. And I was good, not great. Um, and I, you know, up until about sophomore year of high school, that was what that was what I wanted to play in school. I wanted to play something in school. And I was like, you know what, I want it to be basketball. And sophomore year, I end up going to a tryout for an academy team in Jersey with a buddy of mine who I was hanging out with that weekend. It was in the middle of the summer. We were down the Jersey shore and he goes, I'm headed to this tryout. Like they said that you can come. Do you want to just tag along? Um, so we don't have to break up the weekend. I said, yeah, sure. Why not? So I go to the tryout. It was for a U18 team. I was 16 years old at the time and I tore it up and they offered me a spot on this like prestigious Academy team. I didn't end up taking it because they wanted me to quit basketball, um, which I just told them you guys can go get bent because I'm not giving up basketball just to play club <laughs> soccer during the spring. That seems silly. Um, but that was sort of a kick in the butt for me, realizing, OK, you didn't really have any aspirations to play college soccer, but you walk into this scenario and you're like, OK, you're clearly better at soccer naturally than you are at basketball. This is going to be your ticket into playing college sports. So lo and behold, I, I start to go down that path and I start to really focus all my attention to soccer. And between my sophomore and, and beginning of my junior year, I really started to you know, get some decent offers from a decent amount of Division One schools. I had an offer from Air Force after a tournament my sophomore year. And. I really was, I, I wanted to play division one. I. I then tore my knee my junior year. I had meniscus surgery and I was out for eight months and missed the entire recruiting process. Um, all of my division one offers basically became zero. And then it was, I was looking at the likes of Brandeis, Dickinson and Hobart. Those are the three that were after me um, to the point where I had to make a decision between the three. And when I got to Hobart for the official visit, I'll never forget. It was Halloween weekend of twenty. 11 at Hobart, rainy, miserable upstate New York day, just like the worst possible weekend to, to show a potential student athlete. Here's what Geneva, New York has to offer. I don't think the sun was, was out the entire weekend. Um, and I fell in love with the campus. I fell in love with the culture on the soccer team. And as soon as I got onto campus, I think midway through my vi official visit, I called my parents. I was like, this is where I'm going. I don't want to be anywhere else. As much as I'd like to follow up and wonder somewhere in time where I'm a senior at that point at Hobart College, you might have seen somebody dressed as Kenny Powers from eastbound and down that Halloween weekend. Who knows if we actually would have crossed paths or did cross paths well, unknowingly at that point. Well, I know you were at Kappa Sig, and Kappa Sig is known to have some pretty wild parties in that basement, and I was shown the Kappa Sig basement while I was a, <laughs> when I was a senior in high school. And I don't want to say that that certainly was the turning point for me, you know, committing to Hobart, but it didn't hurt, I'll tell you that much. There is some footage somewhere to old cell phone maybe of you and I near each other at some point but yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to go back to that point because I think it's especially important for young athletes that D1 was what was happening the offers the schools the letters they were coming in and because of an injury it changed to D3 being a teenager at the time were there ever thoughts of you know what I'm determined enough I'm going to walk on 
I still think I'm a division one athlete. Was there ever a, you know what? I don't want to be D three. I know the moniker of D three doesn't get enough credit as it deserves for some younger athletes who don't understand what that level is. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. And when, uh, when the offers started to started to stop, if that makes sense, I, I was obviously devastated. You know, I, I had never been injured in my life before. I'd never broken a bone. I didn't know what it was like to sit out more than one weekend uh, due to a sprained ankle. And so like I was lost. And then, I, for whatever reason, I remember having this conversation with my mom in the car. We were driving back from something and, she, and she was talking about like division three soccer. And I was like, you know what that, and she was saying how you could study abroad during the spring. It's not nearly as rigid as division one. And my dad was pushing me to go to like a big 10 school or an ACC school and go walk onto the soccer team as opposed to being recruited. And I very well could have done that, but I also wasn't really feeling the big rah, rah, you know, 20,000 kids, you're just another number type of atmosphere. I wanted something a little bit more intimate. And I, I the the I just got, I started to become romanticized with the idea of division three. And it became very clear that like, that seemed like the best balance. And I also, I, I, dude, I just wanted to go play. That was, that was the other thing. Like I didn't want to have to fight my way onto a team to, to walk on. And then, and listen, that might sound lazy of me at the time, but I just, I just wanted to go play. And that, goes back to choosing between basketball and soccer. I just wanted to play some college sport and soccer proved to be the the best route for me to be on the field and to, and to have a good experience in division three. I would never trade my experience for anything in the world. Uh, if I had to do it all over again, the recruiting process makes it so different for other broadcasters who might look at schools. You being from Jersey, they might look at upstate New York schools. If you're an upstate New York native and look at the Syracuse's and the Ithaca's and the Oswego's and say, okay, I know these are broadcasting traditional schools. That's why I'm going it kind of is a little tease to you really didn't make your decision with broadcasting in the back of your mind. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't think you're even a broadcasting major or a media and society. Let me make media and society <laughs> major at our alma mater. Yeah, no, I, I was a psychology major and I probably could have double minored if it wasn't for all of the, you know, academia red tape that exists within a division three liberal arts school. Um, but, you know, because one was disciplinary and the other one was disciplinary, I couldn't do that. So I ended up minoring a media and society, but, that was, again, before I knew I wanted to be a broadcaster. And um, it, it just, it, I really stumbled into it. I am beyond lucky in terms of like how I got into the broadcasting. And that story um, has become something of uh, like, it's my favorite story to tell. And I never get sick of it because I still think to this day, it is the most ridiculous and obscene thing or, or obscene way for somebody to start their broadcasting career it was quite literally a joke. Um <laughs> And we were, and I'll tell the story now, but we were, we had a preseason game. I was coming off my third knee surgery. I tore my meniscus two more times when I was at Hobart in addition, in addition to the one time that I had torn it in high school. And I was still coming back from that third surgery. And, and one of my best friends on the team at the time, Joey Busatil, who was also a, um, who was also a stand-up comedian in New York City for, for a cup of coffee. So like between he and I, we were two of the biggest goofballs on the team and we were hurt for a preseason game. We didn't travel our student manager. Somebody needed to film the game for, for scouting purposes. So we're asked by our coach, go up and film the game. Okay, sure. His instructions were quite simple. Shut up and film the game. It was a rainy day at SUNY Cortland. I'll never forget it. August in the middle of preseason. And he and I were just looked at each other. Both of us hurt, kind of miserable. We were like, let's have fun with this. We don't know what that looks like yet, but let's have fun with it. Lo and behold, we end up putting on a fake broadcast of our own team's game. <laughs> Not it didn't go anywhere. We took our we we turned the camera around on us. We did a pregame show with empty water bottles. We were in our we were in our you know travel uh, warm up kits, even though we weren't playing. And I put on this like over exaggerated play by play voice. And the Hobart Statesmen take the field against the Cortland Red Dragons. And like it became one of those things where I was like mocking the position. And then my buddy Joey had an English accent on that sounded Australian while he was being the analyst. It was a joke. <laughs> And it was really inappropriate, too. We were like, J.P. White looks a little slow out there. I wonder what he was doing on Saturday night. And then, you know, my, we're like, oh, mate, I know what he was doing with MC that night. You know, it wasn't, wasn't very kosher either. Like, and it, would, it was it, – and that was, like, the most PG thing that we said on the broadcast. So, like, we're roasting guys left and right, and we have a blast. We're afraid to tell our coach what we did, so we tell our assistant coach, who's now the head coach at Stevens Institute of Technology, Division Three in Hoboken, New Jersey, Dale Jordan, we told him, he tells our coach, they pop it in the tape on the, on the drive back to Geneva, and guys are in tears laughing. I'm like, I've got like secondhand embarrassment. I'm like freaking out. I think I'm going to get kicked off the team because it was clear I was the ringleader on this. And I feel a grab 
on, on the scruff of my neck when we we're getting back to campus in Geneva. And I was like, holy crap, I'm about to get kicked off the team for that. And it's our head coach, Sean Griffin, um, who's still there as the head soccer coach at Hobart. And he goes, hey, Ty, you might be onto something here. And I was like, it's like, what do you mean? And he goes, I, you like as much as you were joking around, I actually thought you were kind of good. Like you, you, you called a good game. And I was like, there's no way you could have gathered that. And he goes, hear me out. We do have a student radio station, Pierre Maguire, Inside the Glass, NHL on NBC, Bill Whitaker, 60 Minutes, Jonas Schwartz, SNY, Daily News, or, you know, since he since he left that gig, Chris Carlin, you know, voice of Rutgers basketball and football. Like, we have guys at this school who have gone on to do good things in broadcasting, and I think that they would want to help you. And that's, that's how, that is how it got started, which it just, it's a, it was literally a joke and still seems like a joke, but here we are. It's amazing. A wild story. One of my favorite stories in the history of this podcast. It really is because so many people have that traditional background. I think you have to add a little context here and more to this because even the curriculum you're in. Also, shout out to Rich Keith out in Boston. There's a nice lineage of Hobart people who have that out there. But I think people may not understand this from outside of Geneva. It's not like even in your media and society minor that you're taking a television producing course or you're learning a the curriculum of the school you're at is not even teaching that. So you have to go and do it for WEOS and WHWS. Uh, did everything. I didn't learn anything that was that serviced me in my in my broadcasting career, media and society. And that's not a knock on the, on the major or the minor. That's just simply what it was. Um, and I went to Greg Cotterell, the, the station manager, and I said to him and I was just like, is there anybody else who wants to do broadcasting right now? And he's like, I don't know if anybody's come in here in the past couple of years, let alone, <laughs> let alone in the past few weeks wanting to call some games. So he's let it, you know, he let me call William Smith soccer games. He let me call um, Hobart and William Smith basketball games, hockey games. I took the equipment on the road uh, for a big RIT Hobart men's basketball game on like a snowy Tuesday night. And in, um, in, where's RIT Henrietta, New York. Yeah. And like, and it, it I just, owned all of it. I, I was like, this is, I was like, if this is what I really want to do. And after the first day of calling games, uh, which I ended up calling four games in one day, I was like, I need to figure out a way to make this my career because I've never had more fun doing anything in my life, but this is going to be very self-startery um, because other than Greg Cotterell, there was really nobody to sort of help me. I mean, Ted Baker and Joe Lasky over at WHWS and sort of like the professionals that they bring in to call these games, they just sort of stepped aside, let me call them. And I just had to learn everything on the fly. And I, again, I wouldn't trade it because it forced me to make a ton of mistakes, put myself out there and, and learn the business from basically every angle and, and just create my own broadcasting major or minor for like my last three semesters at Hobart. It's amazing too, to think about in the mid 2010s, you're getting these reps where technology at this point too, like social media and these live broadcasts on non-traditional platforms are at its early infancy stage. So you're kind of in that weird middle of there's traditional over here, the non-traditional is emerging, you're getting the reps that matter the most. And the next difficult part for you is that you get the degree, you leave Hobart, but you're leaving this non-traditional broadcasting school and you've got to find a job in this, what you want to do now post-college. So take us through that. What was that job search like for you hitting the pavement, trying to find a job in broadcasting? straight hustle mode and just nonstop. I cannot tell you how many phone calls, how many emails, how many, you know, indeed applications I filled out and how many I did not hear back from. I obviously created my own reel, you know, about seven and a half minutes. I learned to, you know, make my reel the right way with a couple of exciting calls at the front end, um, you know, a long stretch in the middle. And then, you know, a couple of exciting calls at, 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 the, at the tail end of it and then send it off to as many people as possible. But what I found was just, Emailing wasn't going to do any good. I had to I had to pick up the phone and call people old school, cold calls. Hey, do you have any games that I can broadcast? I don't care if it's for 30 bucks, 20 bucks, if it's for free. I need to find something where I can just continue to get reps because as you and I both know and everybody who's listening and any any broadcaster who's quote unquote made it is going to tell you reps, 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 reps. And that was the best thing about being at Hobart as opposed to Syracuse or Northwestern. I didn't have to wait in line to call games. I, I just called games because there was nobody else to do it. So I had all these reps and I had all these tapes, but I didn't have really the connections to be able to get going. So like I ended up finding through STAA, um, the Trenton generals of the Atlantic coast baseball league, where I not only was responsible for broadcasting the games through, you know, again, 
the the what would now be deemed archaic version of live streaming radio games. Um, but I was also the official scorekeeper for the game as well. So I'm trying to call a game and I'm the official scorekeeper on the on the app. And I got paid eight hundred dollars for fifty games. And basically it chewed up my entire summer. I was also a production assistant at SNY um, through Jonas Schwartz, who helped me sort of get started. That that was a good glimpse into TV, but it helped me understand that I didn't want to do in studio stuff, that I needed to be in I needed to be at the game. Like that's what sort of fueled my fire. Um, and those first two gigs got me started in that summer. But what was difficult was finding and putting together a schedule for soccer games for the upcoming fall. So graduated in May, I had the summer and now like we're talking July, August where I'm firing off emails left and right to, you know, a number of different division one schools all across the Northeast, trying to put together this schedule. So many people didn't answer it. So many rejections, so many where, what, what experience do you have outside of college? None. Okay. Well, we require one to three years of experience. Okay. Well, how am I supposed to get jobs that require experience without having any experience, the chicken and the egg thing. Mm -hmm. But you just needed somebody to give you a break. And so like what ended up happening was, is I got hooked up with Princeton. They had some games where I was allowed to be the analyst. And then they let me call a couple of games uh, for the soccer teams. Um, Holy Cross, a Hobart soccer grad was the volunteer assistant coach, hooked me up with their SID, who then hired me to call a bunch of men's and women's soccer games. And then Stevens Institute of Technology, who had hired the assistant at Hobart at the time, the one who ratted me out to our coach, you know, in that famed game at Cortland, and he hooked me up with calling games. So I was at Hoboken, Worcester, Massachusetts, and Princeton, New Jersey for the entire fall season. And all of that was from cold email, was, was from those cold emailing and those connections. And I was just driving up and down. I must have put, you know, 15,000 miles on my car that fall. But that's what I needed in order to put together an even better reel with that experience to then go ahead and get the next job. Um, but those were my first gigs out of school. And I, I will never forget sitting in the cafe at Hobart and just hours and hours and hours on end of clipping my own reels in addition to trying to find anyone who would let me call their games. Because it's a risk taking a 22-year-old taking a kid who doesn't have any experience and isn't coming from Syracuse or Northwestern. Somebody has that next to on the resume that they're coming from us broadcast journalism school, they're going to want to take them because they know that they're being trained properly. I was trained by me. Nobody trained me. <laughs> I mean, like, and that's not to knock on like Joe Lasky and, um, and, and Ted Baker, but it just wasn't formal training at a big broadcast school. But those were some of my first gigs at a, at a college. John Chalesnick, I feel like owes Hobart a check because there's some ties with STAA and these non-broadcasts. So shout, I don't know how many young broadcasters don't know about STAA and how really good it is to have that hookup. Also, was it the cafe? Was it Saga? Where where was one of those? Cafe, cafe okay, was, okay. was the work right. from home. That was work from home before work gotcha. from home. That was, that was where I set up, yeah. And then there, the third part of that too is what I love about it is, and you stressed this at the end of that answer, was about even though you're not from Syracuse, Northwestern, all these places, the grind is real. The networking has to be bigger. I feel it, man. I felt that story because <laughs> when it comes from Hobart, like, you have this chip on your shoulder in the broadcast and that's not a bad thing, but what it teaches you is that, you know, going out, leaving campus, you've got to outwork people. But that mindset when you leave is a great mindset to have for the rest of your career. Cause that's something you can control. Both of our coaches from soccer to football, the old cliche control, the controllables, you know how hard you can work and being a student athlete, those workouts in August and coming to School before the matches and games start up is so important. So you're going through all these jobs now. You're working these schools. Isn't Vermont at some point involved in your career early on as well? So Vermont um, came into play, and again, another STAA special. So John Chalesnik, all, you know, automatically getting his flowers here for, the, <laughs> for my first two gigs, uh, first two major gigs. And the Vermont one was interesting because I was supposed to be the voice of the men's team. You know, I got through the interview process and everything like that. They liked my tape. The biggest one and the biggest clip that I had that they liked was the day that I decided to take the radio equipment on the road to RIT and really like buy into that self-starter mode, right? And I had a great call that that night. And then that was the big tape that ended up landing me the Vermont gig. But they had just had an issue with their previous play-by-play -play guy who broke some you know story about a recruit that they had signed that wasn't official yet. And they really didn't trust anyone who wasn't formerly on campus. So they had already had a broadcaster who was on campus who they decided to bump up to the men's role. And then I was told that I wasn't going to get the men's, but I was going to get the women's. And the difference between the men's and the women's 
forget gender for a second. The quality of the team was so stark. I mean, like Vermont were were killers in the America East while I was th- while I was there. They went undefeated in the America East. They get to the NCAA tournament and they give Caleb Swanigan and that Purdue team a run for their money. Meanwhile, I am broadcasting games for the women's team, who are quite literally one of the worst women teams in the country. They turn the ball over thirty times a game. You only get sixty possessions in a basketball Ooh. game. They're turning the ball over every other time down the court. But Vermont. Um, I work two different side gigs on top of calling games uh, for for a college basketball team and traveling all over the Northeast and all over the country for that matter. And that was like, that was such a good experience in terms of being able to call a bad team, having my prep work in order and being able to talk about things. Even though I was on the radio, you always have to talk about the game. But once it got out of hand and it was 25, 30 points to keep people tuned in, I had to you know be clever in the way that I was d- delivering that message. And it was a really, really good way to learn how to call a bad team, um, which I also have done with the Chicago Fire as well. Uh, so it served me well in, in, in that arena. But um, yeah, Vermont was uh, was a really big step. And like that was my first, that was when I really felt like I was a broadcaster, where I got hired by Learfield and by Vermont. And I was a part and I was like a part of University of Vermont. And I was bringing that to the fans. And they do have a great fan base in Burlington and and. Burlington, Vermont is a really, really cool place and will always hold a, a special place in my heart. The sports fans care about their catamounts, no doubt. They go out yes. to the games. You said the Chicago Fire, our visual side, by the way, sees the FC there, by the way, just in case you're a fan of the TV show on NBC. There's no confusion <laughs> here. All right, this is the FC right here. So here are these stories. And Chicago, a sport you're familiar with in soccer, is it as quick as Vermont to Chicago? Are, are we seeing that big of a jump? Because that's a huge spot we're changing here for the career because a bigger market and the sport you're most comfortable calling all of a sudden pop into the picture. No. So there was three years in between Vermont and Chicago at a, at a little place in Dania Beach, Florida, which is about five minutes south of the uh, Hollywood Fort Lauderdale Airport. And I had gotten hooked up with them right towards the tail end of my of my tenure in Vermont. It was February. And I'll never forget the night. I was out with a bunch of friends who also worked at the school and I had fired off so many different emails with my soccer reel from that schedule that I had put together um, piecemealed that previous fall, trying to get some sort of soccer gig. Minnesota United was coming into the fold, but there was no way I was going to get an MLS job going, you know, at 22 years old, 23 years old, jumping from Holy Cross, Princeton and Stevens to Vermont to, to MLS. So I was trying to figure out USL championship, which is second division in the American soccer pyramid and seeing if they were going to do any games and, for whatever reason, every email or every phone call that I made, I were there like, oh, like we're not in control of our broadcast anymore. It's going down to Florida. Same thing with NWSL, uh, the Women's League. And I was like, what is going on with this company down in Florida that's getting all the broadcast? So I try to figure out exactly where it's going. And I end up calling the front desk of the NWSL straight up. Somebody picked up the phone, NWSL. Hi, this is uh, I'm Tyler Terrence. I'm a broadcaster, and I and I was wondering if you could put me in touch with somebody about potentially broadcasting games for you guys. Okay, let me put you on hold. Next person picks up the phone. Hello, NWSL. Hi, Tyler Terrence. Blah blah blah. Hold on, let me put you on hold and put you with somebody. I got passed along four different times. Eventually, to the point where I got put in touch with the digital broadcast person, and they were like, "Yeah, so like all of our broadcasts are moving down to Dania Beach, Florida, to this company called Vista World Link. Let me take down your email and send me your reel." Okay, great. That was in early January. And late February is rolling around. Season's about to end. I have no idea what I'm about to do. I'm applying to minor league baseball jobs. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my Mets and I love baseball, but I want to I want to enjoy my game with a beer and a bag of peanuts. I don't have the patience to be able to call 160 baseball games. I just can't do it. So, I need to I need to be in soccer in order to fill out my schedule from March until until November or October. So, I forget about that phone call. For weeks, I get this, I get an email from this guy named Michael Cohen, who is like one of the original soccer producers in this country. And he he helped create a number of different things that we enjoy soccer with now, like the Sky Cam and a number of different things. And he was in charge of putting together this facility in Florida. And he emails me at 1130 at night. I had already had a few cold ones with all of my friends in Vermont trying to stay warm and you know, sub-freezing temperatures. And he said, Tyler. I got your reel through so-and-so, through the person that I cold called it on WSL. I would, we would love to have you down in Florida. Here's Mike Friedman's number. Mike Friedman was my boss at Vista World Link for three years. Give, he's expecting your call. Give him a call or, or shoot him a note uh, tomorrow. And then lo and behold, I get this job in, in Florida. I, pack, I, I go from Vermont to Jersey, get all of my warm weather clothes. I, I go down there. 
And I end up calling 500 games in three years, all Ooh. off, all off monitor. No, I was never at a game ever. What? I say if I called 500 games, I was on site. I was on site for two of them. That was the whole thing that they wanted to take soccer games that weren't at the peak or, you know, weren't super important. Second division, U.S. Open Cup, CONCACAF, NWSL. And they wanted to do all of them for, you know, pennies. And they had young broadcasters cutting their teeth, grinding and trying to get their reps, you know, basically working for uh, close to free uh, when, when you broke it down. And that's where I really started to hone my craft as a soccer announcer and start to figure out what it meant for Tyler Terrence to call a soccer game. Um, and that is that is where the grind unfolded. And then the Chicago Fire happened after that. But yeah, there was a, there was a long stretch um, in 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 Florida where I was calling seven to ten games a week. I did not get to enjoy the beach. I was. You know, these these remote facilities, I kind of liken them to like a casino. There's no clocks. It's dark. There's no windows. They're pumping in oxygen. You have no idea what time it is. You walk in at, you know, noon for a three o'clock game. And then you walk out at 1 a.m. after you call a Phoenix game from an east from an eastern time zone. And then you're like, where the, where did the entire day go? Um, and why did I lose all my money? No, that's not. Actually <laughs> uh, but that was that was in between uh, Vermont and the fire. Uh, to your credit, though, it is truly a skill set to call off a monitor. And you know this is a broadcaster. Maybe young broadcasters don't. Some things as easy as energy of where you are, the energy of the crowd you're feeding off of. As a broadcaster, you can see your eyes ahead on, on the pitch or on the court or the ice or whatever it might be where you could see an open defender or something's go. Little things like that that you can, of course, see when you're at the arena, but you can't on a monitor. And to keep that energy to have that happen, but 500 in three years that is truly we should have called it graduate school Hobart you know plus that's really what it was for you at that point my it's funny that you say that my dad while I was grinding through that he would say you're getting your doctorate in broadcasting that 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 is exactly what you're doing right now he's like you're nonstop. you're not working for much money um and you are and you are figuring it out what it means to be an expert of calling a soccer game and and, and he could not have been more right and so then when the opportunity for the Chicago fire came along and other MLS two opportunities were coming along, they would say, well, are we really going to take a chance on a 26 year old to potentially call games on WGN in Chicago? And my thing would be like, hold on a second. You're not getting a 26 year old. You're getting a 26 year old who's called 500 games. A normal MLS slate has 34. So why don't you count me as like 45 in broadcast years? Because <laughs> I guarantee you that whoever else you're interviewing has not called more games than me. I promise you. Um, but, but you, you could not hit, hit the hit, net, uh, nail on the head more than that. Like I was, that was the broadcasting, not training, but just sort of reps that I needed to get in order to, it, in order to be where I am today. It had to happen. Whether it's an email, whether it's a call, I love that phrase you just used there, because when that call happens, there can be some intimidation when you see the big market, when you see the next part of your career coming. And this is a compliment. It's confidence. Like, there's no doubt, just going back to the student-athlete thing, hey, when you're out there getting your reps and playing, you're confident that you can make plays. It feels like that's what happened when Chicago called, that even though it's a bigger market, even though you know the competition, you're ready. I'm, I'm the guy if you want me. Uh, you know, the, the student-athlete thing, I will never take that for granted, and I will always chalk up any amount of success that I continue to have or have had to that mentality of – there just simply will not be anybody who's going to outwork me or put in more or put in more hours to become better at this craft and that grind. And like, you know, coach Griffin, you know, one of my basketball coaches used to say to me, coach Griffin used to say to me, like, you know, glory is, is so few and fall and success are so few and far in between those moments of hard work, you know, to really be great. You have to endure three years of, of just nonstop grinding for one phone call and then the grind starts over again. And, and like, it, it's just, it, it's, it's one of those ones where, yes, I was confident, but don't get me wrong. Calling games on WGN and a top three market coming out of this mom and pop production facility in Dania beach, Florida, it was intimidating. But as soon as that first, as soon as the light went on with the camera and I'm on the road at Gillette stadium, um, the home of the new England revolution, calling my first game in 2020, right before the world shut down, it was just another game, right? The only difference is I actually got to be there, which was a treat. I, I never got, I, I really didn't get to go to many sporting <laughs> events when I was down in Florida. So like, I forgot, I was like, this is fun. The crack and hear the crowd. I can see things that are going on in the field that the cameras weren't showing me typically. Um, but 
yeah, it was confidence and I knew that I was worthy of the job, but it was a humbling experience as well because there were a lot of things I needed to learn. And, and you know, the production went from four cameras to eight cameras to 12 cameras to, you know, constant production meetings as opposed to just churning out 10 broadcasts in a week. All of my attention was focused on one, which is a totally different mindset. I think we should add this as well, that you've seen this evolution of the sport of soccer in America. Then as a broadcaster, there may have not been as many opportunities or as many matches or whether it be remote, whether it be local, whatever that may be for a young broadcaster in particular. Is that true? Do you see more opportunities now in soccer than maybe when it was 10, 15 years ago for you? Without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, think about think about all of like the student you Big Ten student you Big Ten plus um ACC plus like all of these big time conference that conferences that now have um, student run production facilities. You know, this company down, in, you know, down in Florida, Vista World Link has thousands and thousands and thousands of matches every single year for young broadcasters to go and cut their teeth. Um, you know, there are semi pro games that are being constantly live streamed there. You know, there's now three divisions of lower division soccer uh behind mls that now have broadcasts like it is the the amount of opportunity comparatively from when i was in dania beach from 2017 to 2020 exponential growth like and and that's because like i think that people are starting to figure out and hopefully this will be the case after 2026 when the world cup comes here that this country adores soccer and we are a country built up of immigrants and newsflash soccer is the number one sport basically in every single country in the world except for America. And most people from America aren't from this country. So clearly soccer is going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. And like people like their local flavor too. And they want, they want their teams to be broadcast. They want an opportunity to watch. And as a result, young soccer commentary is, is from like from when I started in 2017 in Florida up, you know, up until 2026 is going to look so much different. And there are so many kids that reach out to me saying, I want to be, a soccer commentator. When I first said that, there was no, there were really nobody else who was like soccer. That's it. Everybody wants to call basketball and football, and, and rightfully so. Those are two of the biggest countries, and that's where the money is. But uh, two of the biggest, two of the biggest sports in this country. But um, it's becoming more and more of a thing where I think soccer is starting to become like a very real opportunity for kids, and there's so much more opportunity for it. And with that opportunity, skill preparation, all that stuff going through your career, you had that moment that so many broadcasters wish strive for the stick that has ESPN, the microphone. You had that moment not too long ago. I won't get into how it came about because who knows, maybe more opportunities will come. And I know there's some competitive broadcasts. I think in a rare sense on this career podcast, I just want to know personally for you, what was that moment like holding the stick for you? Were you hitting up family and friends and be like, guys, I'm on ESPN <laughs> today. Like the like this is legit. Not ES, no disrespect to ESPN plus or, like linear stuff going on with this broadcast. Yeah, it was um, it was a trip, man. Because I got these, and and I don't, I have no problem sharing how how I got the gig, but it, you know, I got two of them when my agent called me, and he was the one who really helped put this together. And I had been on the radar, and they said like, you're doing a great job at the fire. You just kind of like sort of wait your turn because there are guys who are twice my age who have you know minimum contract fulfillments that they need to get done at, at ESPN and like I'm just sort of waiting in the wing for like somebody to like somebody's wife to be pregnant and they have to bail on a game last second or like somebody to get sick like I'm waiting for one of those opportunities and they just happen to have a crazy weekend where they needed an extra broadcaster my agent had been banging on the door and they said all right we're gonna give Terrence a shot um I had let you know as soon as I got the gigs I call my mom I call my grandpa I call coach Griffin anytime that I get any sort of big breakthrough I call coach Griffin and coach Jordan um, you know, the head coach and the assistant coach at Hobart at the time, Dale Jordan, still with Stevens, because they were the ones who pushed me to do this specifically with soccer. And that I was that was the most nervous I've been for for a broadcast, as I'm sure you can imagine, because. Two years ago, I had barely cut, got into the league as a 26 year old who had done nothing but lower division soccer. Two years later, I'm deemed one of the main voices in this country to call a game on ESPN. So that's craziness. It's not it, like uh, beyond fortune. It, like, dude, and and it's bad because I sometimes have moments I was like, damn, I wish I had more ESPN games. Then I have to take a step back and look at myself in the mirror and be like, shut up, you greedy bastard. Like, you can't, <laughs> you can't expect that that's always going to happen and then you're just going to continue to climb this ladder. But 
I had people all over all over the country and all walks of life, former AAU teammates, soccer teammates, who literally just happened to be at a bar, you know, with the TV on in the background muted. And then they see my face pop up like in, in just in a normal pub anywhere in the country and like shooting me texts like, what are you doing right? Why are you who gave you who gave you a microphone and who let you do this? Um, it, it's the whole thing has been wild. And again, and this all started from a joke. That's the part that continues to just blow my mind. And like, you know, anytime I talk to my mom about it, she was like, this life that you're living is just like not this can't really be an actual thing because there are kids who dream of being a sportscaster from the moment that they can like talk. And that just wasn't my, that's not my story. But like, I, it almost makes me even more grateful for how I've gotten here because it's so out of the ordinary and not the normal thing. But that ESPN, those two ESPN games were were a real trip. I would say to say I was much more comfortable on the second one, but they were they were pretty wild. The greatest prank that hasn't ended yet. And when you're yeah, calling your coach, yeah. just be like, they're still buying it. Yeah, yeah. It's actually my old tape that they're showing out there. No, no, we will you get more far more credit than that. Let's talk about a prep. Called over 600, 700 games, matches, all different sports. Let's go through it. How does Tyler prep for a game coming up? Whether it's a shot, sheet, whatever it is. Take us through the prep for a game. So the prep, um, you know, now that I can call one, maybe two games a week in MLS, it's it's much less um, tedious than when I was doing seven to 10 down in Florida, because now I can actually put my attention towards one game and like actually buy into that game, the storylines and everything like that. So, you know, let's say we're coming off of a game on Sat, excuse me, on Saturday, and I usually take Sunday and Monday morning to myself to sort of like, re, you know, reload, refresh, get back to neutral. Monday afternoon, I'm starting to poke around, see what the team that we're playing this upcoming week did over the weekend, um, maybe watch some highlights of that game. And then I'm taking a look at my boards because I had done some MLS teams through Open Cup and things like that. So like I'm seeing, okay, how much information do I have? And I'm just sort of in my mind um, and on my computer trying to figure out how much prep I'm actually going to have to do. But let's say it's Charlotte in their first year in Major League Soccer. I have to build a board from scratch. So I have my Microsoft Word um, that I break into address labels through Avery. You know, I do the sticky um, system where I basically print them off onto address labels and then I put them onto, um, and I actually think I might have a board right here, believe it or not. Uh, here we, we go, have. the second board. Mark Kestisher from ESPN. Tyler yeah. Terrence, the board is coming out for our visual side. The so board. audio side, check this out. So these are, so these are, you know, obviously the address labels and I put them into tactical formation. This was a big 10 semifinal that I did between Maryland and Indiana on big 10 network a few weeks ago. And obviously, you know, as you can tell, each label is corresponding to a player on the team. And then I put them into tactical formation and then college is different because the substitutions are free flowing during the first, um, during the second half, I should say first half, you know, you're, you're not allowed to reenter, but um, it's one of those ones where I, do all the individual stuff first. I want to know exactly which kids I'm dealing with, if it's college, you know, professionals, whatever it might be. And I'm just getting all the basic information down. You know, how old are you? Where are you from? You're on the team. Um, you know, what were your statistics like last year? How are you playing this year? What are your minutes like and everything like that? Then, and that's on like Monday afternoon, Tuesday, then Wednesday, Thursday, I'm going back and I'm watching games. Like I always try to make sure that I watch at least the full game of the team beforehand. Now, Soccer is different from from basketball and football in that sense, where like if you look at a basketball box score, you can get an inference in terms of how a team played. Right. If they shot poorly from the field and they didn't score many points, and they got out rebound. You're like, they did not have a very good game. Soccer, it could be three one, but you have to really go back and watch the game to see if that score line is just if it was warranted, if the team played well and whatever it might be. So I try to make sure that I know like what the form of the team is coming into that game. Um, and then like Thursday, Friday, it's a lot more like I'm on soccerway.com. I'm on transfer market, trying to find these nuanced links between players who might've played at the same club who are now playing against each other, a major league soccer national team um, stories online from their high school newspapers, talking about the fact that, you know, their mom was in the stands who, you know, had just recovered from chemo or something like that. And these great human interest stories that, Guys, that you and I both know for, especially from play by play standpoint, that I might not ever get to during the course of a game. So, like, right. you know, I only get to 20% of the prep that I end up doing. And for me, as somebody who really just calls the game, and I learned to do that down in Florida because I couldn't, because if I can't, if, if the cameras really aren't in your control and you're waiting on things, like, you just have to call what's in front of you. And that's how I view commentary for soccer specifically. Like, I'm not going to storytell, I'm not going to overload you with information. The ball is typically almost always in play. 
So I need to make sure that I'm just calling the game. And as a result of that, I don't get to a lot of the prep work that I actually do. But um, when I do have an opportunity, we have a tight shot of a, of a player or something who just had a good player or whatever, or I say to my director, hey, give me a shot of, uh, you know, give me a shot of Casper Shabilko on the fire. I want to tell a story about, you know, what he's what it's been like for him as a father over the past year since they welcomed their new son. Um, little things like that. But it, it's being over prepared just in case you do have to fill because you don't want to get to, to a situation where you do have filling to do and you're not prepared and you don't have those notes and the stories to be able to keep people tuned in even when the game is out of is out of reach fantastic advice and i'll get you out of here on this maybe it's a young sports fan who's about to watch their first world cup and thinks maybe i could be a broadcaster for a soccer game maybe it's a a young student in jersey or maybe a a soon to be first year, say I caught myself there, first year student at Hobart. Uh, get the best advice, if they want to get to where you are in your career, what's the best advice on how to get there? Oh, man. I, I mean, it's 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 all of the cliches, but they're cliches for a reason, right? Reps, 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 reps. Don't just go somewhere because it might have the highest, rep, the best reputation or it's going to be the highest paying, gig, whatever it might be. Go somewhere where you can cut your teeth and figure out what it means for you to call a game. And then the other one is, um, you know, Vince Scully, after he passed away, you know, one of the stories that was shared is that when he walked into one of his first jobs on the radio and they said, the best the best tool that you have is is you. Don't try to be anyone else. Don't try to be me. Don't try to be Arlo White. Don't try to be Peter Drury. Don't try to be John Strong. Be you. Be, be authentically you. Now, that takes a while in order for your personality to come out on air. And that comes with the game slowing down for you and you becoming an expert and getting your PhD in broadcasting and having calling 500 games or whatever it might be. But do not try to be anybody else because that's going to come through and it's not going to be genuine. And all anybody wants to do is feel a connection to the broadcast when they're sitting at home watching it. And the best way for them to do that is to feel as if you're being yourself because it allows them to sort of settle in. Okay, this person's calling the game, giving me the information. And I and I feel a connection sort of through the TV a little bit, if you will. But reps and just be unabashedly yourself because there's nobody else who is you and you do have something to bring to the table. So um, I know that those are super cliche and kind of corny, but like they're, they are that reason for, for a reason. And I've learned that um, because every broadcast, like I've had conversations with Bob Oshusen with the Jets, um, and on Big 12 and on ESPN, Jim Nance and, and these big time broadcasters who all say the same thing to me. Get reps. Jim Nance's best advice was only do a sport that you're passionate about. I love football and I love baseball, but I don't want to call those. I'm not passionate about broadcasting those. I'm passionate about broadcasting soccer and basketball games, because if you're doing something that you're not passionate about, that's going to come across at some point and somebody's going to figure you out. And it's not fair to the viewer. Um, if you're just doing it for a paycheck and because, you know, you want to say that you're calling a football or, bas or baseball game, that's not right. Do it because you want to bring a good show and you have something to bring to the table and you can enhance the broadcast and viewing experience uh, for everybody at home. Although that is a fantastic answer. I believe the correct answer was tear up your knee, get a camera with your body, <laughs> do a fake. <laughs> Although that's like, your Nance is great. But that's the real answer you wanted to say was run a long prank and well, just, I'll, I'll add a second, don't worry. Try to do, you know, try try to fool everybody into thinking that you actually know what you're talking about for like seven years. Yeah, that's that's real good advice. You know, like <laughs> okay, that's not what you want to do with your life until your junior year. Stumble into a booth, do a fake broad inappropriate broadcast of your team's game, and then just make a couple of cold calls and then you'll be good to go. Yes, that's as you, you hit the nail on the head. Good. I can see the poster going up right now in Geneva's campus. This is what they said. I, I listened to getting there with guys. This is what all the students need to hear. Tyler Nairds, thank you so much for doing this. I know I told you before we hit tape. I've been trying to chase you down. I don't know how <laughs> we missed each other in our ways, but as the rare media guys who are out there from the finger legs doing the thing, I'm blown away by your story. I'm glad I got to wait because it was worth the wait. Best of luck going forward, man. I cannot wait to follow your career. Keep crushing it. Keep grinding. And hopefully we'll meet each other in person soon and stay together for the future and keep staying in touch. So, Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much, man. And any time that I, you know, any time, it really hasn't happened all that much. You know, there's a couple of Hobart kids who will reach out to me and they're doing, you know, the current students who might be doing something um, and they want to interview me or whatever it might be. But to see somebody from Hobart, like it's you know, and, and again, to somebody on the outside who didn't go to Hobart or who goes to a bigger school, you're never going to understand what that connection is with somebody who went to a school that's basically a glorified high school from a student body standpoint. 2,400 kids, like that is nothing comparatively to Northwestern, to Syracuse, to some of these huge journalism schools. And like, this is the first time you and I have ever met before, but like, I genuinely feel a connection because 
getting out of Hobart into a broadcasting world, which is basically reserved for people who go to big time, rah, rah, ACC, big 10 schools. There, there's something, there's something to be said for it, man. And I think that the self-starter aspect of it and being yourself, which is, you know, in a cliche way is encouraged at Hobart. I think it has served both you and I well. Um, and I'm excited to continue to follow your path. And I'm certainly going to look into your story. We're going to have to flip the script at some point. Maybe I'll bring you on my podcast um, for the Intercontinental Football Show and, and we'll get, we'll interview you. Uh, but thank you so much for having me, man. And, and best of luck in your journey as well. No doubt in Hippo Bart forever.